As the nation finally sees more schools reopening for in-person learning, there are many parts of the country that are slow in getting that process running. And still, areas of the nation that are reopening for in-person learning are just not where they need to be. What does the data show now? The real-world data reveal clearly about reopening schools for in-person learning vis-a-vis the coronavirus pandemic. And how can we go about doing this in a safer way? And what lessons should we learn from what we've seen in the public education system over the last year or so? We're going to talk about it today with Corey DeAngelis, a leading scholar on K-12 public policy issues at the Reason Foundation today on Jimmy at the Crossroads. I'm Jimmy Sangenberger coming to you in partnership with the Washington Examiner and Jimmy at the Crossroads starts right now. Gonna talk money, gonna talk politics, great for all generations. Oh, what a great mix, I said. Gonna talk money, gonna talk politics. Grateful to all generations, oh, what a great mix. I got Jimmy and the Crossroads making sense out of nonsense. Come on, Jimmy, what you got? Hello, my friends, and welcome to another edition of Jimmy at the Crossroads, coming to you again in partnership with the Washington Examiner. And it is such a pleasure and a privilege to be with you today, as always, as we talk about one of the most important issues facing our society today, which is making sure that kids are getting a quality education and an in-person learning experience. Please, by all means, I do want to encourage you first to like and share this video if you enjoy the content. And of course, subscribe to the podcast edition of Jimmy at the Crossroads, the Jimmy at the Crossroads podcast on Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts today. And of course, be sure to follow our friends at the Washington Examiner at WashingtonExaminer.com. Indeed, today we are going to speak about in-person learning and how the data reveal quite clearly that kids should be back in school. Our guest today is Corey DeAngelis. He's a leading K-12 public policy scholar when it comes to education. He is director of school choice at the Reason Foundation and has his hands in a few other think tanks, including the Cato Institute. And he joins me now here on Jimmy at the Crossroads. Corey, welcome back to the program. It's good to have you. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Hey, thanks for coming on. So I want to jump right to it. Before we dive into the data and how it's so clear that kids should be back in school, I want to ask you a question to assess where things are at right now so far in our K-12 through reopening effort across the country overall. Well, it depends on the location, but the majority of schools do have in-person instruction available for all students for at least one day a week. But if you look at particular school districts, there are some that still aren't in person at all for uh, any students at all. Uh, And then if you look at the fights brewing in places like Chicago and Philadelphia, the teachers unions have been pushing to keep the schools closed. And what's interesting to me is that the private sector, the private schools have been fighting for the opposite. They've been fighting to keep their doors open to meet the needs of their customers because they know that the families can take their money elsewhere where the public schools and so many places have been fighting to keep the doors shut. And I think the difference there is one of incentives, that one of these sectors gets your money regardless of whether they open their doors for business. Here in Colorado, where, of course, I'm broadcasting from, we've had a big fight over reopening. We've had a lot of issues that have gone on in terms of part-time reopening, whether we do a full reopening, whether it is elementary or high school or what have you, how you break that down. And I've really been a strong advocate in columns I've written for publications that actual, actually sister publications of the Washington Examiner, Colorado Politics and the Denver Gazette for reopening because the data to me is just so crystal clear that transmission in schools of this deadly coronavirus is not frequent, not common, not deadly. What are you noticing from the data? What is it showing us from the real world experience we've had over the last year, Corey? 
Yeah, the, I, I've seen the same thing. If you look at the Brown University data reported by uh, an economist named Dr. Emily Oster, she has shown consistently over the past few months that the positivity rates in the schools for the children is much lower than the positive positivity rates in the overall community. For example, the latest data from New York City, for example, which has some of the schools open in person, has found that the overall community positivity rate is about 8%, whereas the positivity rate within the schools is about a 20th of that, about 0.55% for students and staff alike. Uh, so this suggests that schools are not super spreaders. They aren't meaningfully contributing to overall community spread. If you look at quotes from uh, Aunt, Dr. Anthony Fauci, he has said this. If you look at uh, quotes from uh, Mayor Bill de Blasio and even Governor Cuomo, they've pointed out that they're not seeing a lot of the spread in the schools. And the CDC director has even said before that the, the, uh, or, or the CDC researchers have, have indicated that there's not much evidence that the schools are leading to overall community transmission. And if you look at data from UNICEF from 191 different countries, they recently reported that there isn't a consistent link between school reopenings and overall community transmission of the virus. And one more study I'll give you is from Tulane University researchers in New Orleans. They've looked at data nationwide, similarly finding that school reopenings are not generally uh, linked to COVID hospitalizations. Corey DeAngelis, one thing that I noticed at the end of January when I was working on a column for the Denver Gazette on this topic of remote learning and its negative impacts uh, was the death rate and what we had seen. So as of January 27th, so this is a few weeks out of date, but I think you still can notice a trend when it comes to young people. Among the 359,352 American deaths involving COVID-19, only 203 were aged 18 and younger. Now, as I wrote, the loss of any child is tragic, and I'm not going to diminish that, but 203 equated to 0.0565% of all deaths involving COVID-19. Given all the negative impacts of having remote learning be the em point of emphasis for public schools right now in many parts of the country that we'll get to, the negative impacts, I think that is an important point when you're <clears throat> considering the cost-benefit analysis. Yeah, you have to look at the cost of keeping the schools closed in addition to the costs of reopening the schools. And I would say at this point, the uh, benefits of reopening the schools and giving the families the choice of in-person versus remote outweigh the costs of, uh, of, of, opening, of giving families those uh, additional options. Each individual family should be able to make that cost-benefit decision for themselves. Um, and so we, we shouldn't take that option away from them, it's particularly when you look at the cost side of the equation when it comes to the learning losses across the country. A study nationwide by McKinsey and Company, for example, estimated that children are learning, losing at least one to three months of learning in the past year from school closures. And you have data from individual school districts suggesting that failure rates are jumping uh, enormously over the past year in Fairfax County public schools, for example, their failure rate for students failing two or more classes has jumped by 83% since last year. And then there are non-academic costs of keeping schools closed as well, including mental health issues on the rise for, for teenage, teenagers and the school-aged population. For example, New York Times recently wrote about a doubling of the, the, the child suicide rate for students uh, in Clark County relative to last year. So there are a lot of there are costs either way, but uh, you, need to, you, you need to look at both sides of the equation. And at, at this point, especially with the relatively low risk of reopening schools in person, uh, I think the, the cost of keeping the, school, the, the schools closed outweigh the benefits. Again, we're talking with Corey DeAngelis, Director of School Choice at the Reason Foundation. I completely agree. And in fact, I read that article of the New York Times as well as an article, the Washington Post, that was similar. And both of them have finally started recognizing, and as other national media outlets have, the negative, broad and lasting negative implications of these school closures. And what was so fascinating is when you talk about the mental health side, there was a line, I think it was in the New York Times, might have been the Post, but I'm pretty sure it was the New York Times, where they specifically said that parents they talked to had lost kids to suicide largely due to the pandemic and the school closures that resulted from that, at least the policies resulting from the pandemic. 
they found that a lot of these parents thought it was taboo to say that the school closures were a direct link to their children committing suicide. And the fact that parents had to be shy about speaking in that regard should be deeply concerning and also tell you about the mindset where we've been at until maybe in just the last couple of months, Corey. Yeah, totally. And, and another thing there is even if the schools are open, there, you know, that that's also not good enough. I would take it a step further and say the money should follow the child to wherever they're getting an adequate education because you, you know, it, it, it's a step in the right direction to give the families a choice of whether they go to in person versus remote. But the school might even have issues with uh, the, the fit between the, the child and the education that they're getting in a particular place. So if we had the money follow the child, that could further improve students' mental health by letting them choose the school that works best for them, public, private, or otherwise, or even a home-based option, if that does work best for the individual family. And I actually have a study that's peer-reviewed in school effectiveness and school improvement uh, with Dr. Angela K. Dills from Western Carolina University. And we, sim we also found that school choice has been associated with improvements in mental health for students in the short term and in the long term. Mm. That doesn't surprise me. I think when you have the ability for kids to go to a learning environment that is best suited for their skill set, for their learning their learning approach, as well as for their social growth and what have you, it's so critical. We'll get back to the school choice aspect in just a moment because I think we're learning a very important lesson about the value of educational freedom during this pandemic, Corey DeAngelis. But when we talk about the negative costs of school closures. We are seeing dramatic setbacks for learning, especially for younger kids who really re require those formative years. They, they can't get a kindergartner or a third grader uh, really schooled on how to, how to understand concepts when you're doing so via Zoom. And consider also, I've talked with some friends of mine who have kids who've said, we've got three kids and two parents on Zoom at the same time. That's not a very good learning experience or technical experience for any of them. We got five people trying to do a video chat. Sometimes it cuts out. There's a lot of chatter going on, hard to focus, all those kinds of things. So that's the educational side. But then also you're not seeing, like when I was in middle school, my teachers helped to identify that I had issues with eyesight and I needed to get classes. That's something that in-person learning can bring about. What are some of the other costs that we've seen, Corey, to the failure to ensure that our kids get to edu get the education that they need in school? Yeah, it's just, uh, it, it really limits individual freedom from having the choice of going to in-person or not. It hurts their academic outcomes as we've seen, as we've seen all across the nation. It hurts children's mental health uh, for, for not being able to interact with people uh, socially uh, in an in-person setting. Uh, but then it also is leading to inequities as well, because let's face it, this entire debate about reopening schools or not is disproportionately harming the least advantage in society because the more advantage already have access to alternatives. They can go and pay out of pocket for private school tuition and fees. They can afford to do these things called pandemic pods where five to 10 children band together in a household and they, they can pay for a private tutor to, to cover those costs. The least advantage may, may be less likely to be able to afford these types of alternatives for in-person environments and, and learning environments. And so keeping the schools closed is disproportionately harming the least advantaged in our society. And the way that I ar argue to fix to remedy this uh, increase in inequities is to have the children's education funding follow them to wherever they're getting an education, because then now more, more families would have access to these alternatives, not just the most advantaged. Well, when it comes to technology as well, access to technology at home in order to do remote learning effectively those who are on the poorer end of the income spectrum have much more difficulty in being able to afford that kind of access. And so then that enhances the inequities even more than just parents who are able to pull their kids out of public schools and go into private school or maybe even homeschool because only one parent is working. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, there's 22 states, about two dozen states that have introduced legislation to fund students as opposed to institutions through things like education savings accounts, where the money would follow the child to wherever they're getting an education. It could be the public school if that reopening decision works for an individual family, but if not, they'd be able to take a fraction of those dollars to a private provider of education services, such as uh, private schools, 
uh, micro schools or pandemic pods, or even to cover the costs associated with home-based education as well. So I think in a sense here, the teachers unions have overplayed their hand by keeping schools closed. And the way that I put it before is that teachers unions in one, in some way or another this year have done more to advance the concept of school choice yes. than anyone could have ever imagined. It, it's so true. And Corey, the biggest reason for this is because parents are now recognizing the importance of having their kids in school and thus being able to decide where they want to send their kids in st instead of being at the mercy of a neighborhood zip code school that they have no choice but to send their kids to because there is no school choice opportunity available for them. Absolutely. The pand the way that I put it before is that COVID didn't break the public school system. It was already broken. The pandemic simply s shined a spotlight on the main problem in K-12 education is this massive power imbalance between the producers of the service, the public school system, and the individual families. Families have figured out this year that they're getting the short end of the stick. And in fact, They've been getting the short end of the stick and a bad deal when it comes to K-12 education for far too long. But, you know, it's one thing for a family to not get an adequate education and still have their children's education dollars going to that particular institution. It's another conversation altogether for the family, for the child's school to not even reopen and then for them to still get the family's yes. uh, educa children's education dollars. I mean, the way that I put it is that if your grocery store doesn't reopen, you could take your money elsewhere. Families are starting to think, well, yes. if my school doesn't reopen, I should be able to take my children's education dollars elsewhere. Yes. Th this is a situation where they are literally at the mercy of their public school system and whether or not that school district is deciding to do reopening. And by the way, a lot of times when they're they're making these determinations, they say, okay, we're going to get elementary kids back into school, but middle and high school kids, which tend to be more affected, for example, by the mental health side effects that last for years, like I've I've dealt with mental health issues myself. I've talked about it publicly with depression and anxiety. Those are things that can last for many, many years. And those implications are not going away anytime soon. And so we have to be cognizant of that. And yet school districts are often saying, well, it's good for elementary kids to go into school for full in person. But we're going to do hybrid or maybe stick with remote for middle and high school kids in many cases. Yeah, and you have some places that are reopening the elementary schools, not for learning, but then reopening them for in-person child care services while, pay while charging families out of pocket in addition to what they're already paying in the property tax system. But I, to your point, th this should be an option for everyone. Uh, yeah. Elementary, middle, or high school, every single family should be able to make that cost-benefit decision-making, uh, that, that cost-benefit decision on their own. And look, every single district should have the choice to reopen or not. Every single school, public or private, should have the choice to reopen or not. But And every single teacher should have the choice to return to work in person or not. But we need to give families a choice too. And the only way that we're ever going to do that when we have diverse uh, needs and preferences among uh, millions of, of children across the country and their families, the only way you're, get, you're ever going to do that is to get away from this one-size-fits-all system that doesn't work for every individual family by funding the student directly and allowing them to take those education dollars to the education provider that works best for them, public or private. And look, this will incentivize the public schools to do a better job as well and might incentivize them to get their doors open a lot quicker if they have that competition uh, from, from funding students directly and, and having bottom-up accountability for those public schools. And there's actually one study that's looked at this uh, by uh, a Brown University working paper authored by Hartney and Finger in 20, it, earlier this uh, last year. And they found that, play, that public school districts, after controlling for a ton of different background characteristics, were more likely to reopen if they had low-cost private schools in the area. So school choice competition could also incentivize the public schools to be more likely to reopen in a safe way. Well, in fact, a greater competitive environment in K through 12 education could encourage public schools to make a lot of different changes. That's for sure. So two final questions for you before we let you go, Corey DeAngelis. First of all, what are some of the uh, points of movement, advancements that we've seen in school choice opportunities across the country? What progress have we been making over the past few years and even in the last yeah. year alone? 
Yeah, look, um, like I said earlier, the teacher unions have overplayed their hand because about legislators in about two dozen states have introduced legislation to fund students as opposed to institutions. And then in the hearts and minds of families, if you look at the latest polling by uh, Real Clear Opinion Research nationwide, they actually found that there's been a 10 percentage point increase in support for the concept of school choice in just a few months. Between April and August of 2020, it went from 67% support to 77% support for school choice nationwide. So families are fired up about this idea of funding the students directly as opposed to the system. And if you look at states like uh, West Virginia, they've, uh, they have a bill that's nearly universal. Essentially, o- nearly all families will be able to take their children's education dollars to the provider of their choosing. It passed out of the House Education Committee and the House Finance Committee all in the last week, and it's set, it's set to pass the House floor uh, pretty soon as well. But then you have bills all over the place. New Hampshire has a similar bill that's pretty expansive. Essentially, all families would be eligible for this. And if you look at places like Iowa, they've already passed a bill uh, uh, to fund students directly out of their Senate. And you, there have been places like Missouri and Kansas that have passed bills at, out of either committees or their Senates as well. Well, and this is just, I have no other term for it, but a silver lining. I mean, amidst all different crises, you can see different silver linings. And this is one that could have lasting benefit for generations of kids moving forward as this progress continues to be made. Just a final question for you, Corey, on the issue of standardized testing. Now, I have a lot of problems with standardized testing and how they're done and, and so forth. And I think there needs to be a lot of reform. And yet, despite that, I've been advocating here in Colorado that school districts do move forward with standardized testing. It looks like our governor is going to be doing that. But I think we need to assess just how far behind students have fallen and not allow school districts and the unions to get by with this absolute failure. What's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, it, this helps with tra- transparency, and it would be good to see what's going on in the past year with the testing. I'm with you. I'm not a big advocate of standardized testing either, but it is a form of top-down accountability for traditional public schools absent a choice mechanism. I think the better form of accountability, much more important form of accountability, is bottom-up accountability, giving the money to the families, let them choose the school that works best for them, So then the the schools would be directly accountable to the families. But if you don't have that, you might as well have some type of accountability mechanism in play. And I think that's why a lot of states have pushed for standardized testing requirements. But look, you know, this could lead to more transparency. It'll tell us what's been going on in the past year. But really, the, the only true form of accountability there is, in my opinion, is giving the money directly to the families and allowing them to vote with their feet to hold individual schools accountable. And in the short run, as school districts are trying to hide their failures by saying, please don't test us, please don't test us, this is one way to assess for parents just how bad things are. And then maybe, just maybe, that will encourage more parents to say, we need that bottom-up accountability that Corey DeAngelis, director of school choice at the Reason Foundation, just keeps harping about. Corey, good to talk with you, sir. Thank you so much for your work and for joining us today here on Jimmy at the Crossroads. Thank you so much for having me. Once again, Corey DeAngelis joining us here on Jimmy at the Crossroads from the Reason Foundation. And he is absolutely right on two big counts. Number one, and we started talking about this on Jimmy at the Crossroads last summer, early last summer reopening schools. He's absolutely right that the data is unequivocally clear that transmission in schools is low and risk to students is very minimal. We need to get kids back in schools because the negative repercussions, the negative implications, the harm that is coming upon kids across this country as a result of remote learning to the exclusion in many cases of in-person learning, that damage is not going away. It is irreparable and it is lasting. We must get schools reopened for 100% in-person learning across the country. And he's right in the second point. Now is an opportunity for school choice that the unions never imagined. 
It is a chance for parents to see why educational freedom for their kids is so critical, so important to improving their lives and to setting them off in the right direction, getting them off on the right foot for the future. My thanks then to Corey DeAngelis for joining us here on the program, to our partners and friends at the Washington Examiner, as always, and to you for watching, liking, subscribing, and sharing all of our content. That is it for us today. We will be back next week with more engaging, intelligent talk, saying style here on Jimmy at the Crossroads as we do our level best to make sense out of nonsense. Once again, have a great day, and as always, may God bless America. Talking politics, great for generations. Oh, what makes I got Jimmy and the Crossroads making sense out of nothing. No sense. Yeah. <laughs>